when we were speaking earlier, um, we were talking about it's incredibly important to collect, you know, basically robust data in a pande pandemic like this and basically do as many studies as possible to, for example, we'll look at things like the effectiveness of natural immunity, which was done in Israel, but for some reason wasn't done here. What studies do you feel should be being done as we speak and, and that there aren't being done? What are the most important ones? Well, there are a few, uh, there are some studies that I, that really should be done and they're not being done. So one is we should, CDC should continuously monitor the zero prevalence, the amount of immunity that exists in the population. And for example, Spain did early on a very good randomized study with 60,000 people, but uh, in the US there was a the Santa Clara study which was done sort of by Stanford, which was excellent, but that was sort of one county in the US and CDC should continuously do this uh, on a monthly basis for all geographical areas and for all age groups to see how immunity have developed over time and how it varies by different groups, different locations and so on. So that's sort of basic disease surveillance information that you need to have if you want to optimally uh, deal with the pandemic and they never stepped up to the plate and did that and you can't individual scientists can do like the Santa Clara study in one place and one time but they don't have the resources to do this uh, sort of in a more systematic that, that way and that's the CDC's responsibility to do those things. What also CDC should have done is we know there are 700,000 plus now reported COVID deaths in the US. But some of those died because of COVID, others died because they had something else, but COVID sort of contributed it and sort of helped push them over the, uh, the edge, unfortunately. But then there was others who died with COVID, it had nothing to do, they had COVID when they died, but they didn't die from anything that had to do with COVID, something else. And that's something that CDC should have figured out a long time ago to monitor uh, to what extent the people who are reported from COVID actually died from COVID. And you don't have to do that for everybody. For children, where there's maybe about 400 now, they should do it across the board. But for older, they should just do a random uh, a sample and go to their health records and see what did they actually die from. And so what percentage of them died from COVID versus with COVID. So that's another thing that CDC should have done. Well, presumably they could start today. Right. They could, and they should. The other thing, which is sort of a different thing, not for CDC, but that NIH have done, specifically National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, who is responsible for the infectious disease research, is to look at treatments. There's a lot of information going around about that this treatment works and this does not work. And we know that monoclonal antibodies works very well, so that's an important treatment uh, if you take it early enough. But uh, we should have tried all these other things. and. If they work, we have to have a large randomized placebo controlled trial to show that they work. So you're saying, for example, ivermectin, it's shown, been example, shown in some smaller studies that it works. Yeah, so there are smaller studies that have somewhat conflicting results, um, but you have to have one large randomized placebo controlled trial to actually know if it works, it will prove it works. If it doesn't work, it will prove it doesn't work. And then we can put that treatment to rest, one way or the other. Uh, we should have done that with, with many different treatments. So that's something that NIH should have done because uh, individual scientists doesn't have the money to suddenly do this. When they uh, initiate a project, they will usually write a grant application and after a year, if they're lucky, it will be funded. But in the pandemic, we don't have a year because it's a year to be funded and then another year to do the study, maybe. So it's really the NIH who has the capacity to quickly uh, launch these studies on treatments, and they didn't do that. So that's a huge failure of the government uh, and NIH uh, not doing that. Um, what also should have been done, and I proposed it very early on in the uh, epidemic, but it didn't go anywhere, was to do what's called data mining to see if there are any of the existing drugs that people are used for whatever purposes that actually happen to help with COVID. So people that do it for, uh, for cardiovascular diseases or they take some drug for, uh, for an eye problem or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, maybe one of those would work for COVID. So you should go in there and uh, 
just uh, look and do what's called data mining to see if any of them actually pops up as a beneficial drug. That wasn't done either. And again, that's really the NIH who has the capacity and the resources to quickly launch such studies, and I didn't do it. We, we've heard a lot about ivermectin, we've heard a lot about hydroxychloroquine, obviously drugs that are used by millions of people for other purposes. Um, so at, at this point, you think that this is the time to look at these specific ones or and expand beyond them? Uh, yeah, we should still do those studies, and uh, but we should have done them a year and a half ago. That's when they should have started. So, you know, we've been talking about um, vaccination of children a little bit already, and you've been mentioning how the risk is minuscule. Um, it appears that the White House is kind of setting up to do basically large-scale vaccination of children. I think it's 5 to 12. That was the recent uh, memo from the White House. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I don't think children should be vaccinated for COVID. I'm a huge fan of vaccinating children for measles, for mumps, for polio, from rotavirus, and many other diseases. It's absolutely really critical. But uh, COVID is not a, a huge threat to children. They can be infected just that they can get the common cold. But uh, they're not a big threat. Uh, they don't die from this, uh, except in very rare circumstances. So uh, if you want to talk about uh, protecting children or keeping children safe, I think uh, we can talk about traffic accidents, for example. They are, where there are some risks and there are other things that we should make sure to keep children safe. But uh, COVID is not a big risk factor for children. Uh, I mean, one example is uh, from Sweden uh, during the first wave in the spring of 2020, which affected Sweden quite uh, strongly. But Sweden decided to keep daycare and schools open for all kids ages 1 to 15. And there are 1.8 million such children who lived through the first wave without vaccines, of course, without masks, without any social distancing in schools. Um, if a child was sick, they were told to stay home. But that was basically it. And do you know how many of those 1.8 billion children died from COVID? I think I remember the number because it's zero, right? Yeah, zero. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Only a few hospitalizations. So uh, this is not a risky disease for children. And children are at much higher risk from not going to school, from not being outside, uh, exercising, playing baseball or soccer or ice hockey or whatever. They're at higher risk for not having good social contacts, uh, relationship with other children. So if you want to worry about the risk of children, we shouldn't worry about... Uh, uh, COVID, we should worry about all of those things, making sure they're in school, that they get to participate in sport activities, in cultural activities like music, concerts, theater, and all of those things. That's where we should worry about the children. There's also, of course, been this discussion around masking, and there have been studies, you know, I think even since we talked that have come out about the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of uh, masking. Yeah, so first of all, for children, there has been no good studies. So we have no evidence that uh, uh, mass works in children. Uh, but there has been two randomized studies, and that's the gold standard in science, to have the randomized uh, trials. There's been two studies on masks in adults, one from Denmark and one uh, that was done in Bangladesh. So the Danish studies show that the mask could either be slightly protective or slightly making things worse. So, uh, it was not statistically significant. Uh, but that only evaluated mask protected the person wearing the mask. Mm. The Danish study didn't evaluate whether the mask protect, if me wearing a mask would protect other people. So the study from Bangladesh did both because they randomized not individuals, but they randomized communities or villages. So some villages were randomized to wearing masks, and others to not being encouraged to wear a mask if they could, if they wanted to. Of course, anybody could. Nobody was prevented from doing it. And there we found that the masks reduce COVID somewhere between zero and eighteen uh, percent. So it means that there was either no effect from masks or very small effect from masks. So this is idea that has been sort of going around that masks will we will save us or protect us. Uh, they might do a tiny bit from these randomized studies, but uh, they are surely not a game changer. 
And even if they do prevent a little bit, it, that might just reduce the prolong the time until somebody gets uh, infected. All this emphasis on masks, I think, has been very unfortunate because mm -hmm. it means that the other things that we don't em emphasize, things that actually would help, like for example. Uh, of course, vaccines is, is one example of the vaccine all the people, and that has been emphasized. But uh, reducing staff rotation in nursing homes, for example, or mm. testing nursing home staff more, or using people with natural immunity in nursing homes, reducing into intergenerational mixing during the heights of the pandemics, making sure that all the people don't have to go to the supermarket can, but can get uh, delivered their foods before they were vaccinated. Now when they're vaccinated, I don't think it's a, it's not a big issue for them to go. But so there was a lot of things that could have been done. In schools, for example, uh, increasing ventilations in schools. Some schools have very bad ventilation. Now, we don't know exactly how much better ventilation in schools would reduce COVID because kids are at very low risk, so it might not do very much. But at least it's something that we know has benefits for other things like uh, asthma or allergies and stuff like that. So improving ventilation in schools is something that's good no matter what. Uh, for other things. So it's sort of a good thing to do, uh, even if we didn't have COVID. It would have been better to emphasize things that actually do make a difference than things that are, have no or only very small benefits. Mm -hmm.